I made a couple of suggestions. So ba basically, what, what we want to have is we want we want it to be possible to figure out what the yeah, gas cost of the whole thing is in o in O of one time and in O of one memory reads. So the suggestion I had for mod X was that we would take the yeah, the bit length or sorry the byte so we would take the the byte length. Then we would look at just the first byte, and if the first byte has is uh, um, has less than eight bits, then we would kind of appropriately discount it. So, like one example would be that if you have three bytes and the first byte is two fifty five, then the exponent length would be counted as twenty four. If it's three bytes and the first byte is let's say three, then the byte length would be counted as eighteen. Now, if you have let's say 10 bytes and all of them are zero bytes except for the last, then the byte length would still be counted as a nine times eight or 72 because that's just the way the algorithm works. But you can argue basically why the hell are you throwing in a value with, pre with a leading zero bytes in the first place. So that, uh, that basically is all I had to say on all those gas costs. So what would be the step, next step to actually so determine? Then, um, I think, so to determine uh, on the elliptic curve side, I'd say, and possibly just, uh, I mean, agree on preliminary gas costs for the purpose, uh, for the purposes of testing. And then maybe, or, or perhaps all the, uh, the other thing we could do is just have, uh, like, actually, no, I think the practical thing to do is that we, agree on some preliminary gas cost for testing purposes. So then we get to the point where we're passing the tests, and then we actually see how many milliseconds it takes C++ Go and Parity to run through some of the yeah, test, uh, uh, some of the test cases, and we uh, go from there to figure out what the final values are. At least that's one approach. Um, on the mod X side, I think we would need to, first of all, figure out in principle what is the right, like, whether or not we're going for this bit length approach, and if so, what what approach are we taking in principle? And then the next step would be kind of finalizing a very precise definition. So I did some uh, performance measurements on uh, the pairing function mm -hmm. in C++, and uh, it resulted in roughly 60,000 gas times the number of uh, pairs plus 40,000 if we target 20,000 gas per millisecond. I'm not sure if that target is correct. Mm -hmm. Wait, okay. Um, so my next question is though, is what numbers do I get and parity get? So I, I would prefer to uh, um, avoid finali uh, uh, finalizing the gas costs until we have uh, enough numbers from all the clients to make, sh uh, to make sure that we're creating a reasonable gas per second floor on all of them. Yeah, which we would set in the constants, but it would be good to finalize that uh, algorithm for Monix pretty early, I guess. Okay, so we'll do the same benchmark by next meeting. Yeah. So, so maybe all three all three sides do a benchmark, and also all three. So a get C bus plus and parity should also figure out what uh, what floor makes sense. So I will. I think like the most principled way to figure this out would be to just basically see what is the, what is the most uh, what, what is the floor now. So I guess that for elliptic curve, I mean, in general, elliptic curve addition should be constant, I guess, and yeah. uh, multiplication Multi should also depend on the size of the of the scalar, right? Um, I, I would argue that there is not much benefit in making multiplication depends on the size of the scalar because pretty much all multiplications I've ever encountered in cryptography multiply by random 256-bit numbers, and so I don't think we really lose much by just going straight to the worst case. 
Right, that's a full point, yeah. I mean, there's some use in, okay, you, you can kind of abuse multiplication to compute the inverse or something like that, but that would be a large scalar anyway, so yeah. <laughs> So maybe we'll put uh, the the numbers that Christian have for now mm -hmm. uh, to like start with something and to actually do some tests and the next meeting or before the next meeting uh, if if we get more benchmarks we can adjust that. But yeah, I, I would go with the, with the numbers that we have so far last ex last example. Okay. That's so perhaps just a, sorry, um, is 20,000 gas per millisecond a reasonable number or what do the other thing, others think? Um, so I recall that we arrived at 20,000 uh, 20, gas per millisecond because we looked at basically what are the, what are the most, e most inefficient other opcodes that we had and we got something like uh, 50, uh, 20 million, uh, like 15 to 20 million gas per second in the worst case. You, uh, is that correct? Uh, so I think I did a comparison with, with other pre-compiled contracts and uh, right. internally with uh, Malmot, I think. Yes. So maybe, yeah, in, in general, I think 20 million gas per second is definitely fine. Yeah, so I guess the, the, the other benchmark, it would be good if the other benchmarks could also, uh, uh, yeah, check that with other pre-compiled contracts. Um, so uh, what, what thoughts do people have on the, on the uh, mod exp issue? I, I have a comment on that one, because okay. um, if anyone can hear me, yes. um, the idea was there to accommodate the, the fact that we have 256-bit uh, memory stores, so crafting the, the request is kind of optimized for 256-bit, um, but the content might be much less. So what if we <coughs> only care the topmost 256-bit and assume if say the exponent is like a thousand bits, we assume that the, the bottom 700x bits must be set and we only consider top 256. So then it's only, you know, the exposure is limited. Right. So basically uh, the exact proposal I have accepts that instead of looking at one, the top one byte, we look at the top 32 bytes. Um, um, yep. Yep, um, I'm okay with that. I mean, this is a this is a constant effort and can be priced in with the yeah baseline gas cost. Yes, yeah. so yeah. yeah. Vitalik, do you see what Hudson is writing? In the trouble. Yes, uh, let, Vitalik, let Vitalik know to proceed when, when to the next item when done with gas. Mm. Yes, so basically the other concern I have is that I wanted to just basically like uh, kind of accentuate the fact that with uh, the fact that uh, the revert opcode can return things, we actually, like basically it, it was uh, Joseph for BTC really, really pointed out that we actually are making a major economic change, which, uh, or at least a, a a significant economic change, which uh, in some ways does break BTC Relay's current model. And the change, be, well, basically, the problem is that BTC Relay worked, and potentially a lot of there were uh, you know, other applications might also work by 
charging some very small amount in exchange for give, uh, give, uh, reading some, uh, some value from the contract state. And so the idea is that this is like one way to do a paid oracle. And with the revert opcode, what you can do is you can basically call to a contract, then in, in, from, a, from the contract make a call to BDC Relay or whatever other thing, get the response, then in the outer contract you would uh, hit, uh, use the revert opcode and you would revert the response. And this way the payment that you would make, that you would make for, uh, in exchange for the response would be reverted but you would still get the data out. And so I base, this is something that's not, not possible to do easily now. So like right now, basically, the easiest way to kind of cheat these contracts out of data is by uh, basically asking for a, ask for a Merkle proof of the state, and this is arguably much more much more expensive. Whereas here, all we have is just basically a tower of two calls, and that's all. And that's all you need to circumvent any any, any kind of paywall. So if I can uh, add to that a bit. Um, uh, go ahead. Yeah, we discussed this a few weeks ago, and uh, so I, that's why I opened that ticket against BTC Relay. But the thing is that um, even without return data, you can always do the same thing with the revert and return one bit at a time. So you can do an oracle, you can query BTC Relay, is this header valid, is this transaction valid, get it back. And if you don't, if, if all you want is Wait, hold one on, bit, so how, exa how exactly does the one bit oracle work? Uh, I think so I. Would, oh, I see. Example. You would revert, you would revert, and you would use the amount of gas that you revert with. Mm, I would either revert or I would not revert, and I can... Well, but if you don't, but if you don't revert, then the payment goes through. Yeah, but you can, or well, you can revert in a different place. Um, right, but if you uh, revert in a different, oh, I see. So you could have like. A tower can, of three call, yeah, uh, a tower of calls. Okay, and basically you would get back. Yeah, so. so you can you can extract one bit of information that way, and you can do it. Uh, yeah, so one way to do it today is is the magic with uh, that you mentioned. Another way is to actually use uh, throw. You can do it the same way, but it's much more complicated because, uh, especially for BTC relay, it's not constant how much it costs. Uh, so. It will be easier to do that with something which is constant. There's a sample code in the chat for BTC Relay. Yeah, right. Well, revert is it doesn't ensure information. You're cutting out. Sorry, can anyone make sense? Uh, Andre, I think you're cutting out. Quite yeah. A lot. yeah, Andre, I think your audio is messed up. So, so I've never found the paying for Oracle's case particularly compelling simply because it is so, it is entirely plausible to just fetch the data from the state and, and create make Merkle proof. So that's only difficult so long as nobody's put up a Merkle Oracle. Um, I've always, uh, I think the, if Oracle's... So the arguments would data, be... That. Then they have to charge so for... The argument would... So the argument would be, I think, that even though a payment of 25 cents might not be defensible, a payment of, let's say, one cent still would be defensible because the cost of either of these attacks would still go higher than one cent. And one cent might be all that you need in order to pay for the transaction fees of uh, maintaining one of these systems. I just, I don't think that it's a property that we should strive particularly hard to protect because uh, doing so disables other useful use cases and ultimately once the data is posted to the public blockchain relying on artificial barriers in the VM to prevent people from reading it just yeah. seems like it seems like the wrong approach to take. Okay, that's fair. Um, if, no, if other people agree I'm fine with it. 
a question. So, so essentially, right now you can uh, trick the BTC relay by making a throw and making a call into your same um, <clears throat> verification, and then uh, uh, checking the result of the throw to see if it's verified or not, and avoiding the payment. Right now. Mm -hmm. Yes, but you basically have to know how much gas the BTC relay will consume, and you will have to uh, to set a low amount, low enough amount of gas um, to to be able to distinguish between a natural failure and your uh, explicit throw. So it's I been see, kind of difficult to do today. I see. So I was reading the, the, the example by uh, Alex uh, to try and understand how it works and th now I see why it uh, um, does this gas calculation there. All right. Thanks. Hey guys, can you hear me now? I think I fixed my audio. Yes. Yep. Oh, excellent. Yay. Um, okay, so uh, was that it for that um, item? Yes. Okay. So and what that was, was the decision on that? Oh, go ahead. The, what was the decision on this item that uh, we just don't want to put any artificial barriers? Yeah, I think so. All That's right. what it seemed like. Uh, was there anyone who was like heavily opposed, or would it have an alternative? Okay. Cool. Um, and that covered. That covered the revert opcode, correct, Vitalik? I was fixing my audio, so I only caught half of that. Yeah, I think we're going ahead with revert as is. Great. All right, um, so the next one is uh, Yoichi uh, talking about EIP-96. Um, uh, so go ahead, Yoichi. Yes. Yeah, it's a triviality um, in EIP-96. Uh, 256 blocks into Metropolis, the block hash instruction can change its internal working. And then the same EIP also says the gas cost for block hash should change from 20 to 800 or something. My question is if this gas cost change should happen at the first block of the metropolis or 256 blocks after that? Um, hold on, should the gas price of block cash, okay. Um, There's a link in the so agenda so that actually discusses it and points out in the code, I believe, where, where he's talking about if anyone needs to look at that. Yeah, I'm looking at this now. So I think we did agree in one of the previous calls that we would uh, uh, to make a change to EIP 96 so that to restrict it so that technically you could argue that one way to implement not EIP uh, implement it would be to not change the behavior of the block hash output at all. Um, so did the uh, does the gas cost increase? Um, oh, I see. Yeah, it's a um, would, mm -hmm. I'm checking in previous meeting notes right now to see if uh, this was discussed. Mm -hmm. But but I definitely remember that too. So I did we I think we said that I, I want to look at the notes before I make any we, comments. I, I'm pretty positive we said that block hash would continue to return only the 26 most recent hashes, and if you wanted older ones, you'd have to call the new Oracle contract. And right. if that's the case, that's that seems, yeah, if that's the case, it seems like we could change that back so the price won't change and the, um, you know, the functionality won't change. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's a reasonable choice, and uh, shall we go along that? So the gas cost increases only uh, 256 blocks after Metropolis starts. Well, I'm suggesting that we needn't increase the gas cost at all because it will continue to operate as it used to. Um, and if you want to access older stuff, you have to call the Oracle contract. Mm. It, yes, yes, uh, that, that, that's uh, very just... So one thing, uh, just uh, one, thing I'd one thing I'd suggest is uh, it, 
just as an as an experiment, see if we can kind of like basically I want to see how long would it would it take to do a million basically a million rounds of uh, calling the uh, a delegate calling the block hash contract over and over again, just to see that if someone decides to decides to implement a kind of history free uh, implementation, then you know would they have to, uh, would they incur any uh, you know, like extra difficulties there? Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Is this ninety six we're talking about? Ninety six, yeah. Okay, I'm looking like, at basically that. what I'm tr what I'm trying to make it possible to do is I'm trying to make it possible. I'm trying to uh, make it possible to make an implementation of uh, the of the protocol that does not depend on any kind of history access that's not in the state and that doesn't require any kind of additional weird data uh, weird data structures. In which case. Implementing the block hash op code would be uh, uh, would be basically just either calling that contract or just reading its reading its storage once. And now we could, of course, argue that those particular storage storage keys are going to end up being in the cache. So it's not uh, it's it's not like this is a particularly serious issue. But I'm basically trying to wonder if 20, if a 20 gas is low enough for that kind of implementation or whether something slightly higher would make sense. I would propose to increase the gas cost. Mm. <clears throat> and those clients which can use the old implementation, they might be saving time by that. Mm -hmm. uh, but we should assume that every new client would implement it through the Oracle. Mm. That's my proposal. Okay. If we, if we increase the guest cost, can we just do it on the Metropolis block instead of two G six blocks after? Yeah, I think that's more consistent. Mm, okay. With all other cost changes, yes. No. Yep, we didn't I don't have notes uh talking about this specific part of ninety six, but I posted the ones I did find. Um if anyone wants to read those to kind of see the what, what we talked about previously on that. But it sounds like we came to a resolution on that. Uh, yes, I think I got an answer on my question, so I'd ask Vitalik to change his EIP text to clarify this point. I have um, to clarify that the gas cost has increased to... Uh, okay. uh, I'm not uh, asking okay. about the amount, I'm asking about which block shall the cost change. Um, the Metropolis um, Hardcore the, block then. Okay. Okay. Yes, um, that's enough. That's uh, I, have, I have one question about uh, the CIP. Uh, so, if we are going to deploy a bytecode to that contract, why don't we charge the actually the gas cost of executing it? Um, so there is actually about three different ways to implement this. One of them is to execute the get, One of them is to execute the code. One of them is to read that particular account storage. Um, I'd also argue that a discount might be prudent because if someone tries to call this contract a whole bunch of times, then it'll just end up being in the cache. On the other hand, though, I could see how it's about how it, how it would be kind of a very principled upper bounds to calculate the exact cost and charge that. So, yeah, I plan to do it, but didn't have time so far. Okay. Personally, I'm not overly worried about a conservative price because I don't expect many contracts to call it, and those that do probably won't call it much. Yeah, I and mean, I think like 800 will be fine because like it's still, it's basically one call anyway, and you no, know, I can't imagine there being applications that'll be willing to that'll be afraid of pay, of uh, paying. A lot for block hashes, and the, but that's uh, yeah. Like, like basically, I don't really expect there to be applications that needs to kind of spam block hash reads enough for for even a fairly substantial increase to be a a, a substantial issue for them. Yeah, my thought exactly. Okay. Next point is also about the same EIP. Uh, the next point is about the nonce of the system account. The system account is uh, after Metropolis supposed to 
all this block hash contract in the beginning of every block. So this yes. increment. Now, so notice that it is a call and not a transaction, right? So transactions increment nonsense calls don't. A call transaction would increment a nonce, and a call from uh, the EVM would not increment Correct. the nonce, so I felt ambiguous. Correct. So by call, I mean a, a call. Of, uh, I, I mean a call from the EVM, and I, uh, okay. that's how I usually use the word call. But I'm happy to uh, clarify that. So the nonce would not be incremented. Correct. So the code pathway that you should use to implement EIP ninety six should be the same one that you would use in like the call op code. Okay. Cool. Yeah, Andre and I had some disagreement over this, so it's great to okay. have an answer. Uh, can we move to the next item that's a that's a different EIP? Yes. Okay. Sounds good. The next point is about EAP 98, the intermediate state removal. Uh, when you read the EAP text literally, the change starts one block after the Metropolis hard fork block. But uh, I guess it's a typo. So I guess yes. that change should start at, uh, okay, cool. And that was it. Yes, it should be greater than or equal to. I can update that right now. Okay, cool. Uh, my last point is actually, well, maybe not uh, uh, pure triviality. It's about the E211 return data copy. Mm -hmm. When return data copy wants to copy more than returned, what should happen? Uh, currently, the body of the text says uh, between zeros, that's the same as all data copy, but Nick suggests exceptional holds. Um, I think both are reasonable. Uh, I think at least we should gather opinions here and try to reach a consensus sooner. Yeah, um, my, my own view, as I've uh, stated in the, the EAP, is that um, reading past the end of an array is almost always an error, and therefore we should treat it as such, um, and that silently returning zeros is likely to lead to undetected bugs. And I know there's an argument for consistency, but I think we should fix the issue where we can, rather than introducing it into new opcodes. Okay, yeah, I don't see... Uh... We are a technical issue with Nick's suggestion. Uh, apart from that, uh, we will have two very similar opcodes that behave differently. Um, more weight in implementation and testing and remembering the VM spec, but uh, that, that, that's uh, just mental costs. Exactly. All the other address spaces are well defined to be uh, valid for all addresses, and yeah, we should should be the same for consistency. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I mean, as I as I said, I, I think consistency is a weaker argument than uh, this is the wrong thing to do. Like we, we should be consistently wrong if we can avoid it. I, well, I, I think it's called a copy also then. Because uh, there is at least one contract currently on the blockchain that will fail if code copy, oh, sorry, no, if called out a copy um, throws an exception because it deliberately reads four bytes past the end. Oh, okay. So I think I commented on the issue, but I can't find the comment anymore, so it might be lost altogether. Um, Nick, so uh, what, is the, what is the problem we're solving here? It is the problem of incorrect encoded input data, right? Um, well, it's, it's anything where it tries to read data that doesn't exist. Yeah. Silently returning zeros is, in my mind, extremely likely to lead to undetected errors and uh, very unlikely to be the intended behavior.
but if if the return data is uh, fully specified to always be uh, virtually infinite and contain zeros, then what is the error we're dealing with? But the the actual return data isn't infinite. So, like the the contract that returned the data specified a return length, and if you then try and read past the length that was specified by the the returning contract, that should be an error because the data doesn't exist. I mean, so what I want to say is that when we compare this to the the error to that that sparked this discussion, and the error was incorrectly encoded uh, user input data then uh, we have a different situation here because the data we're dealing with here is usually uh, created by, um, yeah, we, we don't have Wait, sorry. errors what, here. Hmm? What errors spark the discussion? I, I'm, I'm arguing this in a, in a vacuum, I think. Purely that reading past the end of an array should be an error because the, the data should be undefined and um, not just silently filled with zeros. I can't think of a single situation where filling it with zeros is a good thing. I want to ask Greg uh, what this means for even 1.5 because in even 1.5 it should be easy to detect potential exceptional faults before executing the contract by just scanning the code and I think Introducing a new kind of exceptional fault might make this more difficult. Greg? Oh. Uh, yeah. ah. Trying to find the unmute button. <laughs> I, I agree with Nick that it's totally wrong that, that we treat it that way. I've been told it made the description mathematically simpler. I don't know if you have an opinion on that. Um, I also agree I, I wouldn't want to extend the mistake beyond the domain it's currently in. And yes, if we insist that, um, that all code is going to be validated before it's run, we can, we can catch things like this. Um, much more easily, and I think I think Martin's here. I believe that would be true for Wasm also. But Greg, wouldn't that be a a new kind of runtime exception condition that cannot be validated before actually evaluating it? It didn't sound like it, but I could well be misunderstanding. Um, I don't think you want to have me take time to reread the EEP and think about it more at this very second. So, because uh, the, the memory offsets are not constant and known to the validator of the contract, uh, you cannot check it uh, before deploying the contract. There you have it. <laughs> the, 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 the indexes are, are dynamic, so you can pre compute them on the runtime. time. Okay, so but, but wait a second, this, this discussion is uh, not relevant because call data copy always copies to memory, and there we anyway have a dynamic gas condition. So whether we run out of gas because we run out of gas because we have to enlarge memory or because we access uh, return data beyond its length, that doesn't matter much, does it? We only have one throw instruction. It has no data. We don't distinguish why it throws. And you also, uh, I assume, don't, uh, you, you don't think you can statically determine whether that throw instruction is reachable or not. You just assume that if there is one, that it could potentially throw. But we can determine whether any instruction is reachable. Really? What if the condition is uh, if this uh, piece of uh, bytecode evaluates the true, then throw? Oh, that sense of reachability. Yeah, so I mean the same would seem to apply for call data to copy. You can't statically determine in all cases whether it can ever happen, but you can, you can if it's impossible, you can say so for certain, but if it's possible, you just have to say maybe. 
Exactly. And I think the same would go for call data copy pasting into the array. So just to clarify, uh, when anyone says call data copy, we m that person most likely says return data. Sorry, means yes. Data copy. I also made the mistake before. So yeah. Now I hear people with truly different opinions, and uh, it's uh, not uh, reasonable to accept, expect uh, consensus in this call. So uh, shall we agree to continue this discussion on the place linked from the agenda. So actually, I'm I'm indifferent. Is there okay. someone strongly uh, for uh, yeah zero extension? Akadi Akadi was arguing for consistency between different instructions. Yeah, Arkady, do you want to elaborate on that? Well, yeah, my point is that it just makes a simple definition of the protocol. Okay. Yeah, I, I think that there are more people in favor of explicitly, instead of filling the out-of-bounds array or the out-of-bounds error with zeros to actually just not let it happen and throw in errors, what I, it sounded like the majority of people were for that. Am I wrong? I, that was the impression I got. I, I'd be curious what Vitalik thinks as well. I'm f fine either way, oh, personally, although one thing I will point out is that I remember there was um, resistance to doing things like, uh, like, so like one of the reasons why, for example, the division op code in the EVM returns zero when you divide by zero instead of throwing is that we uh, did not, like, at least some of us did not like the idea that you can have uh, parameter-dependent throwing. And so, like, basically they liked the idea that um, the EV, that opcode should only throw because of like actual out-of-gas. And then any, anything that happens after the out-of-gas step it should, is, uh, it should like, basically not throw under any circumstances. And throwing on bad return call uh, data, uh, data would kind of conflict with that. I think that that confuses developers, or at least when I'm developing, like it, everyone I've talked to, the thing they have the most problems with are the fact that throws don't act as a lot of modern programming languages would act when something is thrown. It's not always just one single error. It usually gives a little more indication. So if there's any interest and in providing more information on throws in the future, I think this would be a good first step, personally. Well, I think Revert will do that to some degree, um, or yeah. at, least, at least the throws generated by code rather than by the VM. Okay. Right. So it sounds like we're, we're pretty much mostly in consensus that um, the behavior should be that it would explicitly throw an error rather than uh, fill with zeros. Uh, am I accurate on that? I guess so. I guess cool. so. All right. Yeah, uh, Yoichi, uh, is that uh, in that uh, point of discussion, is there any other comments? Yes, I asked exactly this point. Perfect. Okay. Um, the next one is Yoichi. He has a proposal for freezing EIPs uh, for to allow for testing for Metropolis. Actually, hold on. Uh, um, yes. Just to go back on oh, just to go back sure. on that one point. Okay. Um, one thing I realized is that back um, back when we were discussing EIP five versus EIP eight versus return data copy and so forth, I recall one of the one other proposal being based, so like the the original pro pro problem that we were trying to solve is basically how do you deal with variable size return data, and I remember one of the proposals being that. You would so right now the way this works is that before making the call you would expand the memory for to cover the full range of the input and the full range of the output, and one of the proposals was to switch to the full range of the input, um, so expanding the full range of the input at the start, and then expanding to the output, but only expanding to as much output as what as was actually provided after the call was made, and this was. Uh, 
like in, in some ways a very, a very, a very nice so, a nice solution except that i remember that it ended up falling out of favor precisely because it introduced this or this uh, idea that the uh, an operation inside the vm might throw because of something because of the actual execution of the operation and not just because of uh, get, uh, because of initial gas computation issues and so if we're willing to abandon that principle, perhaps we'd be willing to go right back to EIP5 and EIP8. But would you make the, the, there's still a big difference here. So the uh, accessing return data beyond its length can be, I mean, the, there is, there are even, the other call proposal, there the error condition would only be checked after the callee returned it, which is a much later point in time than uh, yes. the point where you read the inputs. For a return data call. So it's okay. still, um, so I guess though that the point is from just from the point of view from the point of view of kind of making a software abstraction, I think the argument in favor of kind of purity is that you want to be able to break down every single VM execution into two parts, where one part just does gas consumption and the other part does and just um, like ex execution and only the first part can throw. But that's, I mean, if I do a M load at a very high memory point, or if I do a yeah. call data copy with a, with a high end point, that is the same thing. It, it both depends on values on the stack. Oh, okay. I can, and, yeah. I can see that. Um, so, Hmm. Oh, do you have any other comments on that, Vitalik? No, that was the only comments I had. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, okay, so I think it still stands that because some opinions have shifted or become less strong on the fact uh, that we can, you know, throw for things other than just being out of gas airs. That we can, um, we that that is still the or the conclusion is still that uh, on that EIP, um, the behavior would be throwing an error rather than uh, filling with zeros. I guess. Yeah. Okay. Cool. I think I, I think I followed all that. Um, the next uh, thing is Yoichi a proposal to freeze EIPs to allow for testing. We, um, Dimitri Martins Wende and I had a call on Monday discussing the testing for Metropolis. There was an agenda, uh, uh, there was a topic, how, how much of the tests have we covered? We couldn't answer because the EIPs are still changing. And some of the EIPs look stable, but there's no indication that these stable looking EIPs will not change. So we don't know how many of the EIPs will not change and we don't know how many test cases are ready. So my proposal is to introduce a notion of freezing a NIP for Metropolis. And after a NIP is frozen for Metropolis, basically it cannot change until Metropolis. Uh, if there is a severe problem, NIPs can be dropped from Metropolis. Or if the fix is very easy and everybody says, well, we have enough time to test this, um, this, can, this change can be made, but this has to go through uh, unanimous. Everybody agrees vote in the board of meeting. And my question now at this point is, shall we or should I try to write a meta EIP about this process, or shall we? There is an opinion. If there is an opinion, shall we, we shall stay away from these kinds of formalities? 
I like the rigidity of your idea um, and the fact that it will allow for things to be a little more clear in the EEP repository, which is still pretty messy. Um, the, the people maintaining it have just been busy with other things. So I think that um, one thing is to, yeah, a meta EEP, um, and this actually goes back to what um, Alex Bergzazi put as a meta EEP. It hasn't been uh, accepted yet, but it's just basically a file that says here's the EEPs in Metropolis, and along with that we can amend that to have a column that states when an EEP has been finalized or um, no more changes will be accepted to that EEP. Uh, except in the event, like you said, of an um, extenuating circumstance, uh, potentially where there would be a bug found, or maybe there's an EEP with a small, or maybe an un like a, a consequence that you discover while testing that it relies on a different EEP uh, that's been finalized. So I, I think that that's fine. Uh, we should kind of, uh, you know, be flexible as we move along uh, in saying that, you know, Depending on the size of it, just try to have a lot more open communication between the dev teams when there is an issue to immediately get feedback so we don't have to rely on the actual audio all-core dev call since it only happens every two weeks. But otherwise, I, I think it's a great plan. I see, I see. And Alex has already made a comment in the group chat, so I will try to write up something and show it to Alex Hudson and anybody interested. And in the next meeting, I'm coming with some more detailed draft, I hope. Yeah, I, I think that'd be good. And people can also close their EEPs, um, their PRs or whatever, or put a comment saying, I'm done, and then the editors will go in and um, you know approve it add it to the repository and then actually close the PR and any, you know, issues related to that and only reopen if necessary. Um, so is, are there any other comments um, on this plan? Anybody opposed or have an idea about it? it looks fine to me. Great. All right, awesome. Uh, the next item is any subtleties we need to work out with regards to Metropolis? Um, does anyone have anything on their mind as far as a subtlety or something that may have not may have not been discussed or uh, we need to discuss? Um, I think Vitalik, you wrote that as a as a topic. Did you have anything in mind? I uh, didn't have anything. Uh, actually, hold on. I think I might have had. So, well, th there's the one that I've been talking about for a while, but that we. Uh, Actually, I mean, I guess technically it's part of, e, uh, I think it might be part of EP86 that um, uh, creating a contract fails if it already has, uh, if uh, the destination address already has code. But I was more thinking in mind like smaller things that have to do with like uh, the way that non-synchromenting works or gas calculation or like other boring details of that sort. The, that sounds that like something that would... Mind. Yeah, that, that sounds like it would be need to be defined in the EEP, and as implementation goes through, I feel like people would ask those questions. But yeah, everyone should feel free to voice those concerns in both the EEPs and the all core dev chats. I, I know Yoichi's been good about that when he's been uh, applying them to the yellow paper. Okay. So yeah, if there if no one had anything for any quote subtleties, um, yeah, well. Uh, okay. One thing that is uh, the point that Fabian raised about uh, origin to these new transactions. Is that something we need to talk about? Because the issue he raised is that the origin will basically be totally useless for the new types of transactions. And his proposal was to use uh, the verifier contract as origin. So, asking more generally, is there a use for TX origin? At some point, it was banned because people deemed it being insecure. So, yeah, people haven't really used it much in a while. Doesn't that just mean uh, the transaction where it originated from, even if it hops through multiple other accounts? Yeah, it's the, the account that created the actual think, transaction. Yeah. So, I think the original uh, use motivating use case for, was it uh, was uh, so that 
contracts could uh, refund uh, transaction senders for gas payments. But I would say with uh, EIP, EP86, it's not really necessary because we can open up ways where any contracts down the chain could just pay for gas directly. So there isn't a need to actually take it out of the system. It would just be pretty no. much useless. Yeah, I mean, yeah pretty much. I, I think it's a bit of a mess personally, and I hope uh, so as he removes it from, you know, access to it from future versions just to prevent people accidentally treating it as, as something useful. Mm. Uh, so, so Martin, did that somewhat answer your question? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, any other subtleties? Okay, great. Yeah, thank you. Um, so as far as um, the time estimates and testing and release, let's first just kind of go through the teams and see where everybody's at. Um, uh, we'll start with Yoichi since he's been doing some of the yellow paper stuff. And I think what we've talked about today is kind of outlined where you're at. Basically, Oops. <laughs> Oops. Oops. Yeah. But I'm supposed to speak now, no? Maybe That's I can come to Do you hear us? Yep. Ah, okay, we thought we were dropped from the internet. Um, the yellow paper, so I have created an, a PR pre-request for every EAP considered for Metropolis. I believe we, they are mostly up to date with the and yeah some predictions made about well that that was agreed today um that's the yellow paper status i've been reading the metropolis changes in cpp slm slm and parity and i'm halfway through it okay great i'm back on <laughs> Okay, cool. And then we'll go to um, Geth, if there's someone here. I, I think maybe Pavel or... Okay, I'm back. So, um, okay, that was, uh, yeah, Python. I think that's everybody. Um, C++ team or um, Dimitri testing, if you all have updates. Vitalik, actually, um, C++ client is um, working, um, and um, we implemented the uh, lips, uh, lips and um, the tests are ready, and uh, Yuchi just now tested that. Wait, oh, oh, um, what, what were you just saying? <laughs> so I'm, saying too well. that, I, I'm saying that snark tests, and... Uh, are working and um, you could check it against Python. Okay, great. Um, have you checked Python's tests against the C++ yet? Mm, not yet. Um, maybe uh, anything stopping you from doing that? Um, currently, Yochi has no. built a branch. Uh, he could uh, do that. No, uh, but... Well, okay. Uh, then, I, then I will do that. Okay. <laughs> What were you saying, Yoichi? Uh, there's no blockers. That was what I was trying to say. Okay, great. Um, and was there anything else, uh, either Yoichi or D Dimitri, on the testing end um, for... Uh, I think I saw a new EAP about standardizing the way that tests are formatted through JSON. Is that correct? Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. We have a um, consensus issue with is, um, JSON uh, files format and how integers um, encoded in JSON files for tests. So someone from Python team um, insists that integers uh, should not be prefixed by zero, leading zeros. And um, and uh, Pavel think that uh, that's nonsense to prefix uh, to add uh, 0x prefix to contract hashes and other hashes. 
so we have um, quite a few issues um, Okay, and you said that was between P the Python JSON files that are submitted? The issue is in uh, how, how the test tool reads the tests. Okay. And uh, this is to not have a format for JSON test files, which everyone agrees. Okay, um, well, what, let's do this. The EAP's out there, so... Um, if anybody here who has who does submit those kind of test files could go in and comment, and uh, if no one, if or if not enough people comment on it, we can pull in some people who submit and see if we can come to consensus on that. Um, uh, hopefully soon, so we can get those standardized for when we're submitting more for Metropolis. Sound good? Uh, well, yep. Okay. Um, the next item, let's see. Oh, actually, was yeah, was that it for testing? I'm currently working on static call tests, and uh, it will take a while. I see that uh, static call EAP is the most static one, so there will be lots of tests coming for that EAP. Okay, sounds good. Um... So the next thing would be time estimates for testing and release. Um, so I think because of the price spike, we're given a little bit more time, and it's looking like because of the um, the uh, there's a lot more testing that has to go on because of so many EAPs, we might need to look to more of a July release. Is my opinion, um, Vitalik? I know you've been thinking on that. What's what's your opinion? Yeah, so I can just run the um, uh, Ice Age script again um, with the latest numbers. Let me just do that right now, just for, for the fun of it. Um, okay. Um, hold on, hold on. Damn, Ice Age. Uh, so the current difficulty has gone up to 428. But the block time has gone up to 15.73. The timestamp has gone up to 14952. And the block number has gone up to 37331261. Okay, so if we want to maintain a 20-second block, to, uh, keep the block time under 20 seconds, then our deadline is July 14th. And if we want to keep the uh, block time under 30 seconds, then our deadline is September 12th. Okay. That gives us a good amount of time. Um, so is anyone willing to... And I, I think... Hmm. It sounds like from uh, until we freeze these EAPs, we're not going to have a great estimate on testing. Would that be accurate, uh, Yoichi and Dimitri? At least. And uh, once I start uh, working on particular AP, um, I sometimes find uh, issues uh, when making tests and uh, I need clarification on some EAP. So you see the questions about the AP that might pop up when we start working on tests. Okay. Yeah, the feeling I'm getting is late June would be the absolute earliest for a release, and that's if a lot of things go really well with testing. Um, does anyone have any other opinions? That's, again, just my opinion based on just kind of seeing an overview of all of this. And they won't make it in July. Okay, you're saying it should be later than July? Yes. Okay, sounds good. So um, what is the time you want to reserve for testing on the testnet? So the, dif the distance between testnet hard fork and mainnet hard fork? Hmm. I can't hear Oh, Vitalik, you cut out. Try talking again. Is another people here? I can hear you now. Or at least I thought I could. Can, can you hear me now, Vitalik? 
Yes, I can hear you. Okay, you're cutting out uh, off and on, but just try talking again. I think we can hear you now. Um, hold on. My, uh, inter my uh, internet's getting crappy. Uh, okay. If you disconnect, reconnect, that's fine. Um, until then, was there any other comments on the timing and things like that uh, other than Vitalik? There was a mention of testnet um, testing. Uh, so the, the, when would the testnet uh, fork happen and when would the mainnet happen? Um, which testnet are we talking about? My assumption is Robston, unless we create a new one. I'm not sure. I've heard both things mentioned in the past few months. Um, I mean, it has to be a testnet where all clients can participate. So this points on to Robston, I would say. Yeah. Does Geth not support uh, Coven? So CPU right. Ethereum supports neither. Ah, I see. Okay. So yeah, oh. it would have, it would need to be Robston then. Yeah, I was thinking either Robston or Rink B. I don't know how to pronounce it, but yeah, if if CPU Ethereum can't, then uh, it has to be Robston. Yeah, and I think it, it should be Robson because that more accurately reflects the basically what the current conditions are. It's a proof of work test net uh, that co consistently gets attacked, whereas you know Coven and Rink B are more controlled, so that wouldn't reflect true conditions. All so, right, yeah. this is hope nothing nothing bad happens during the testing period, uh, like it happened like last week. Something happened to the uh, test net again. It was yeah, for... exactly. Yeah. We yeah, can also. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say we can also do um, uh, a Robston reboot where we, you know, start from a either a snapshotted and minimized or, or compacted um, Genesis block or just a, a clean uh, Genesis block. Um, in okay. order to, yeah, and perhaps impose a you know a hard cap on the on the gas limit to prevent any kind of attacks and um, yeah so yeah. just saying we don't have to you know to, um, keep Robson going we can do a reboot or uh, you know a refresh um, in preparation for testing the the hard fork okay sounds good yeah so we have a lot of options it seems like and I think this is something that doesn't need to be decided today necessarily Again. Does it make sense to increase the meeting frequency? Okay, I'm back. My phone is freaking out. Um, can everyone hear me still? Yeah. Yeah, I don't think it needs to be decided today because, um, uh, yeah, because it'll be months before at least uh, beyond. Uh, you, what was the estimate you gave, Dimitri? You said um, after July is when we'd be able to test, or it was after July when we'd be able to launch? Uh, not, not able to launch. We need more time for tests. Oh, I see. I see what you're saying. Okay, I thought you meant that the test wouldn't be done before July. Okay. Um, hmm. Okay, so it sounds like we can't really get a block number down today. Um, but between now and next meeting, we're going to have uh, the freezing of some of the EAPs, and we're going to uh, potentially have a little more standardization with the uh, – and um, also we can start looking at what it would take to do an alternative to just using what Robston is today and doing either a reboot or um, some type of configuration change. Um, Casey, I think you have already looked – because you were involved in – um, getting Robston back on its feet a few months ago, would it be significant? Would it take significant changes to do some of the things you mentioned? No, not significant at all. Okay. Would it make uh, sense to have a change freeze deadline? And after that deadline, deadline, nothing can be changed in any of the EAPs. And if something is not in a state you're happy with, that it just dropped. Just iterating on, on the OHS freeze proposal. I think that's an okay idea, except for the fact that some of these EAPs were decided on um, 
related to other EEPs. So I, I believe Static Call Revert and a few of those other ones were all intertwined in a way that made them work together best if they were all implemented. So for something like that, I feel like that would be an issue. Am I uh, incorrect in thinking that? I, um, I think those those are actually fairly specified. Okay, so yeah, they might not be as interconnected. Uh, Vitalik, can you hear us now? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay, so uh, Casey, just while you were gone, Casey brought up that uh, we likely would need to use Robston because we would need to use a uh, testnet that the clients can all support. And additionally, if we want, we can, because there's been a lot of Robston attacks lately, we can do a reboot and configuration change to like limit, you know, gas uh, or um, uh, mm -hmm. what was it again, Casey? Yeah, hard cap on the on the gas limit. And as was. long as um, uh, so, the hard cap would be test net only. Um, right, and I mean it, it's a soft fork. It was what uh, you know Parity right, tried okay. to do um, during the original attack, but right. We can enforce it as a soft fork, just uh, you know, by um, putting the majority, pointing the mining power um, at the at a miner that imposes the limit. Right. Yep. So that that's probably the route we'll go. And then uh, Dimitri stated that um, we wouldn't be able to re be releasing until August, and until then, we need to figure out the length of time that a testnet would need to be on. And uh, so, for instance, like if the testnet needs to run for two weeks or six weeks or four weeks or what, uh, what, what opinions did you have on the timing and uh, anything like that, Vitalik? I am personally, I'm inclined to say two weeks should be f uh, should be fine. Um, the justification being that, I am pr practically speaking, for all the previous EIPs, we've uh, uh, two well two weeks is more is more lead time we've, than we've ever had for a hard fork, um, and. and also, like, I'm not sure that any more time will help much, especially given that it, like the bulk of the uh, error catching is going to be done uh, before everything even gets released. Okay. Uh, yeah, that that sounds like um, a fair point. Uh, with I guess the caveat of that would be if there is an issue found, the uh, I guess it would be extended in that case? Correct. Okay. That sounds reasonable. So let's just say this. Um, it definitely won't be the end of June, and if things go right over the next few weeks, we're going to have a number of things such as freezing EEPs and some testing improvements. Um, additionally, if there is um, anybody on this call or who listens who is able to help with testing, and wants to pitch in, uh, please reach out to myself, Dimitri Oichi, or uh, Martin Holswende, and uh, we can get you hooked up on that. Uh, we could use all the help we could get in that area. Um, so, yeah, if anyone can devote any kind of resources, that, that would help move things along uh, for Metropolis. Okay, um, I think that is pretty much the end of that. So the conclusion to that bullet point would be, that we don't have a date, um, and there's going to we're going to know a lot more the next meeting. But it's definitely not going to be end of June, and the testing time for uh, the amount of time a test net would be running before we actually launch would be at minimum two weeks. Um, and we'll, we'll have more discussion on that next meeting. Okay, um, let's see the time. Uh, we have a couple of minutes, um, so Christian, if you wanted to just get some feedback on your thing real quick, that can be the last item. All right, um, so um, yeah, dev developers often face the problem that they it's it's quite hard to see when the user interface needs to be updated. And also, wallet developers uh, currently have no way to see whether an external account uh, gets receives a transfer via an internal call. So um, it might be beneficial to implement something like uh, yeah a, a listener filter 
uh, index data structure that is uh, filled or triggered whenever an account is touched by anything uh, inside a transaction. Um, yeah, Arcadi said that something like that is already implemented by Parity. And what are other client developers' thoughts on that? I've I've proposed this for Go Ethereum before, um, building Bloom filters for all the accounts that were in some way touched by a request, so that you can narrow it, narrow it down. Um, at the time, it wasn't hugely popular because you'd still have to actually trace the calls in order to to determine what changed, um, or you know, potentially uh, check balance before and after the block, but I still think it, it could be worth doing. Um, I guess the other objection was that it would take up more disk space. Arkady, do you have an... Can you name a number about how much disk space that, that needs? Well, I'll have to look it up, but from the top of my head, it's like additional 20% the database size. Oh, um, how big is the Bloom filter in, in blocks at the moment for topics? It's 256 bytes. Right, so if we assume a similar size, um, we're talking about, let's see, about another 9 gigs. Nine gigs? No, sorry, nine megs. I was saying of Bloom's blockchain plus overhead, um, which you could probably expect an index database to be about the same again. Um, more so, even if we're using the transform Bloom filters that we're currently adding to Kef. So the size overhead may not be significant. Okay, so um, the size wouldn't be significant for Geth. Um, any other clients have any comments? Well, another objection is that uh, the light clients wouldn't be able to um, you know, do, execute these queries. Yes, and ultimately this is either this is client specific or we define an API for it, in which case it's an RPC level thing rather than a consensus level thing. Like I don't think there's any reason to add this to consensus personally. I mean, you okay. devs don't have to trust uh, a response. I mean, so if an account was touched, they can always verify by, by rerunning the transaction. And yeah, it's very yes. hard to... But a client could maliciously leave out a change so you don't detect it. Yeah, that's what I wanted to say. But... Sorry. I mean, it, it's still very useful, even if it has that property, I would say. Yeah, I, I think it's useful as a as a client side optimization anyway. I mean, the idea is you you register a, a callback whenever your accounts are touched, and when they are touched, you just read their state again. So, and you can also read the state at regular intervals to avoid uh, the 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 attack of not being notified. Okay, so is this already an EAP, Christian? Uh, I don't know yet. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just didn't know if this was referencing an EAP or if this was just an idea and we maybe I know it's don't know. Idea, I mean, yeah, we should focus on Metropolis anyway, but I just wanted to get some, some feedback. Okay, sure, no problem. Um, cool, so yeah, feel free to EAPify that and uh, I'm going to trademark that term. And uh, yeah, I think that is the last agenda item. Did anyone else have anything, um, or did anyone read anything neat in the troll box that they want to announce? Um, something that we may have not known. <laughs> I didn't understand anything in the troll box, so I had no idea what they were saying. All right, cool. Well, there, uh, there's I, no other topics. I guess oh, I should, uh, uh, yeah, I should invite. Uh, Anyone with ideas about address checksums, um, <laughs> I'm working on an address checksum uh, format, so uh, yeah, come talk to me. Yep, I would like to talk. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> cool. All right. 
Uh, anybody else? All right, talk to you guys in the... Oh, go ahead, Nick. No, I was I was just going to um, ask the parity folks whether they were going to implement DNS anytime soon. <laughs> It's on our to-do list. Good, cool. Yeah. All right. All right. Uh, thanks, everybody. Talk to you all in two weeks. Bye. Bye.